Psalm 39, verse 1. I said I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was done with silence. I held my peace even from, uh, from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my day days as a hand breadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not whom shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb, I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou, was re when thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. O spare me, that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. Now, Psalm 39 is a psalm of David, another psalm of David. You know, most of the psalms are attributed. Well, no, I wouldn't say most, but um, about half of the psalms are surely enough David's. And notice the uh, subtitle to this um, psalm. To the chief musician, even to Jeduthun, Jeduthun, Jeduthun. And uh, that's a psalm of David. Now, it's kind of interesting that when we see a, a subtitle like that, we see a name. That's probably a biblical name that not many in here probably recognize. Um, that wouldn't be one. That would be a good trivia uh, test question because... Most preachers would miss it too because he's, uh, he is mentioned in Scripture. It's kind of interesting. And we learn a little bit here. And David sort of, uh, you know, ascribes or dedicates, if you will, this whole psalm to him. It says, to the chief musician, even to Jeduthun. Now, who is this man? Well, we learn more, most about him probably, and if you'll turn over with me to, or back to 1 Chronicles chapter 25. And, um, and you know, I, I always go into this and you say, well, why? Well, if, De if David dedicated this psalm to him, I think what we need to do is understand who he wrote it to. Right? And uh, that will help us g grasp a little bit of the psalm. Now, this man is mentioned in 1 Chronicles 16 too, in verses 37 through 42. And you can read that if you want. And he's mentioned here in chapter 25 of 1 Chronicles and in and, and the first eight verses. He says, Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph. Or Asaph. Now, Asaph is one who wrote some of the Psalms. So now we're getting into some of the meat of the coconut, so to speak, okay? And of, he, he got of Heman and of Jeduthun. Now, so you see Asaph and Haman and Jeduthun mentioned sort of at the same time. Uh, they're separated to the service of these three who should prophesy, watch this, who should prophesy with harps, with psalteries, with cymbals, and the number of the workmen according to their service was. Now, if you go back and you reach verse 2 all the way down to verse 8, or verse 7, actually. And um, it, there's a lot of people that uh, is ascribed here in the Chronicles as musicians. It's amazing. 
And, uh, and that's for the life of me. I can't understand my Church of Christ friends, who the old Church of Christ, who don't believe in having any instruments in the church. I, I, they, don't, they don't have any of them in there. And, I, and, and I've, for the long, that's always puzzled me, and it puzzles me now still. And, um, and because the Bible speaks so much of instruments. And so the, what do we learn from reading 1 Chronicles 25? And what do we learn from David in Psalm 39, who is attributing a whole psalm to this man? And uh, we learn this. We learn the importance of worship with music. We learn the importance of worship with music. Now, it is quite challenging in our, in, in our day uh, because there's a question, it seems, to be in some of our churches as to what music is worshipful. You know, is it contemporary music? I, you know, it, that's, contemporary is a relative term because of the fact is back in the day when Amazing Grace was written, Amazing Grace was contemporary back in that day. And we have some contemporary music. I learned a lot when I, you know, I, I learned a lot from other preachers and I learned a lot from just reading various things. But Brother Tom Knickerbocker, he's a pianist and, uh, and he's written some songs and he's written books about music and, uh, and what music should be in the church and his idea of it. And he, and he lays out the difference of hymns, spiritual songs, and you know, and, and gospel music, and as a as a as a whole, and um, hymns are very worshipful because they attribute things to God. I challenge you to listen to some of the contemporary music of our day, and you listen to it, and you ask and see what it does, because a lot of the times. It almost goes back to chant type things of the past. I always call it seven lead music or song. They sing the same seven words eleven times. You don't have to know much. You just get seven words down, and you know that's what they're gonna say, because that's all they know. And it's almost like a chant, almost like a chant. You're singing it. And also, if you'll notice something about the the contemporary music, and I'm not condemning all of it. I'm just saying, if you'll notice something about it, it does, they don't sing it like we sing hymns. And how they don't sing it how we learn to sing. Because we come in on the downbeat. Am I right, ladies? We come in on the downbeat of the measure of the, of, of the song most of the time because when we on, on hymns. Well, they don't do that. They come in on the upbeat. I can't do it. <laughs> I just can't get there. I, it, I cannot do it. I mean, because I'm waiting for the downbeat because that's what I always know. And, uh, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be wait, I'm gonna be behind, or, or you know, in that. So it's different. And then you got to ask yourself a question: What is the music designed to do? I saw this in action down in Montgomery, Alabama, during the Ten Commandment issue, when pe different groups would come down there at different times in the evening. During the day, it was just people like me who you know, were there and, and people standing around, they'd sing. And this is what I learned about the crowd that was down there. They said, well, let's sing some hymns. Got, got some girl stood up and said, let's sing some hymns. And Well, we didn't have a pianist or anything. We didn't have music or anything. And, and they said, let's sing some hymns. And, and let's sing the old rugged cross. Well, nobody knew the words. I did. Well, everybody knows Amazing Grace. They did And so they couldn't sing the hymns. And I didn't know their other songs, so I couldn't sing those. So, you, you know, I, I learned this. Then that night, you know, you get somebody up there to sing a, a very worshipful song, depicting this music to God and attributing Scripture to it and all. And, you know, and everybody just sort of sat there. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you get a dance team up there all dressed out in black and and then you know they up there and they doing these slow moves and all that good stuff like that crowds okay 
then the music picks up, the tempo picks up, and then they start doing some kind of gyration that looks like you're on a disco dance floor, and the crowd goes crazy. See what I'm saying? The crowd goes crazy. What happened? You appeal to the flesh and quit appealing to the spirit. So it's, you, you got to so be so careful in, in that. I appreciate, I see our kids here and our teenagers, talking about our teenagers and, 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 our, and our kids, they love the hymns. They love singing these songs. A lot of them sing a song, they only look at a book. They know them. That's good. Amen. And so we learn the importance of worship with music. I believe that's what we are. They're, out of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 16, 1 Chronicles 25, we don't know anything about anything else about this man and uh, that David attributes this whole psalm to. And um, evidently he and his sons, along with Asaph and Haman and their sons, were in charge of instrumental worship and thanksgiving to the Lord. That's what we gather from all this. And uh, we know he prophesied by music. That's kind of interesting. And for some reason, and we don't really know why, David attributed this whole psalm to him and not to Asaph or not to the other guy. Maybe he was the chief musician. He calls him that. So maybe he was the chief one in charge of it all and these others worked with him and under him. With him. Maybe that's what it was. And uh, so as we look at this, I just want to uh, just... Do a little bit of observation. That's what we've been doing on Wednesday nights with these psalms. And we learn some things. In verses 1 through 3, David said, I learned wisdom through a muzzled tongue. Now, this is something that uh, I wish I could get a hold of sometimes. I have, I have too many, way yonder too many Popeye the Sailor Man moments. I, and, and my Popeye the Sailor Man moments, they get more and more and more and more. And uh, I'm getting to the point I don't even have spinach enough to, to eat when to go into these Popeye the Sailor Man moments. I mean, the world has just gone off the rail, man. It's just, and I, I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut. I go, I stroll through Facebook. I don't like to get in other people's sandboxes, but when 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 I see something and I just I, I pass by and then it, Josh, brother Josh, it just eats at me. I got to go back. Just got to go back. And here I go. Then I find myself in an old discussion for a while. And it don't take long to get jumped on on Facebook. I guess I don't know if anybody here learned that, but I've learned that really good. It doesn't take long to get jumped all over on Facebook. Somebody is going to nail your hide to the barnyard door. That's what they're going to do. And I've had mine nailed there so many times, I just know where to go. I, I just go. I say, here we go again. Let me get back up there. Because, I mean, here we go. And uh, I just, but sometimes, and, this, and I understand, this right here, listen to what David said. He said, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. He says, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. This is where wisdom with a muzzled tongue comes in. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred. But boy, verse 3, this comes out, rings bells with me. Me and David get along good because I'm all, I'm all with him right here in verse 3. Y'all follow me? Miss April, you with me? Okay. My heart was hot within me. Ooh, I know. I know. While I was musing, the fire burned. Yeah. I'm all over. I, I, I'm, all, I, I'm, just, I'm just sitting there thinking, and, and the whole time I'm thinking, I'm telling them what I can tell them loose living line liberals. And I said, boy, Brother Scott, I just, whoo. I mean, feel like it's just going to blow up, you know. I mean, he says, as I, as I was musing, the fire burned. You know, I get it. I'm there. Then I spake with my tongue. And here's where I hadn't learned. Okay? I learned a lot going through this psalm, Brother Mike. 
here, I, I understand where David is up to this point. And I understand what he says after this point. But just like Paul said in Romans 7, that which I want to do, I don't do, Brother Joe. And that which I don't want to do, I end up doing. That's me. Go get on the barn door because I'm fixing to be nailed again. Okay? Because what did he say? He says, when I have done stood all I can stand and I can't stand no more, he says, I spake, he says, I spake with my tongue. But what did he do? Verse 4. He didn't speak to the ones he wanted to. He didn't say, he said what he wanted to say, but he didn't say it to the crowd that was around him for a, a couple reasons. Number one was because he wanted to honor God. Number two, he didn't want to blow his testimony to the wicked that were around him. You got me? So instead of saying what he wanted to say to the people he wanted to say it to, he says, I spake it because it burned within me. But I said, Lord, make me to know mine end. He prayed. Now, if I could just get there, it would be good. All right? I'm not going to pray for patience. I did that one time, made that mistake. Not going to happen again. I don't have the patience I ought to have, but I got a lot more than I used to have because I prayed for him one time. And, and, and I know what God does there. And I, and, and I ask God for a lot of things, and I ask Him for wisdom, <laughs> but I try to stop short of just asking for patience because uh, He's going to give you patience. There's only one way to get patience. The trying of your faith, faith work is patience. That's what James tells us. So I know how God does all that, okay? But when, when you have something you got to say, Lord, David says, I'm going to go tell God about it. That's a good thing to do. I just hope, I, 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 Brother Mike, I just wish I could get that. David was learning all this. And uh, holding silence. Now, James has a lot to say uh, 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 about the tongue. You know that, don't you? He says a small member. It can do irreversible damage. And it can. I get it. And... Uh, he compares it to like it's a small member, like a rudder of a ship, but it turns a whole ship. I mean, the tongue's powerful. And once those words leave here, they can't be taken back. I don't care how much sorry you are. I know, I've been there. I know. Hey, this, you know, I, I, you know there was Miss Margaret's Andy Griffin series. You know, when Andy puts that big old whatever size foot he had, he said, how can I get all that in my mouth? I'm a pro. I don't know how I do it, but, I, I, but it gets in there good. I, I got it. So I feel David. I know where he is. Okay? I mean, David does not want his words taken out of context by the wicked. And we're living in a world today where either, A, if you want to say something, you probably just need to say it to God. Number two, if you're going to say something, less, less said, best said. That's what I always say. But it makes you sort of look like you're cowardly when you don't answer something. And so we got to be, you know, so he says, hold the silence, you know, wisdom, with a muzzled, you know, tongue, okay? Self-control is about what David's talking about. Temperance is a good thing, uh, you know. You know, in, in difficult situations, David is teaching us here in the first three verses or four or five, six verses there. In difficult situations, we can be calm, we can keep our heads, and we can hold our tongue. Now, I have amazed myself at times. I really have. There have been times where I have gone through some real things that I look back and I said, I don't even know how I did that. Like, didn't fire back, you know, because if what was going through my mind came out, it wouldn't have been good. You know what I mean? Forget about the words. There have been other stuff going on, you know, because the flesh is flesh. Y'all got me? Y'all with me? And, uh, you know, so I, I, 
is re- keep silent, talk to God. Less said, best said. Uh, you know, when it got too much for David, he says, when I had to speak, I prayed. Boy, if we can just learn that right there. And then the second thing I wanted to point out, so, so much to point out, but when he did pray, what did he pray for? Or what did he say? He wanted God to show him his frailty and the brevity of life. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Thou hast made my days as a hand breath. That's that right there. Not much. He says, show me the brevity of my life. And what does James tell us? What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a short time and then it vanisheth away. And over in Psalm, in another Psalm, Psalm 144, this is, a, a, you might want to mark down this verse. It's in, in Psalm 144 and verse 4, Look what the psalmist said there about the brevity of life. Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. It's like a shadow. Not much there, is it? Lord, show me. And what was David saying? Show me how insignificant I am. David prays to understand this truth more fully. Because if we understand how frail and how short our lives are, and how insignificant we are, boy, that insignificance teaches us what? Humbleness which we all need. I love Brother Caleb the way, you know, preaches. Remember, you know, he got a song, I believe, he wrote about it. Him and his family, one wrote, called A Speck of Dirt. Remember that? Remember that, Brother David? He says, I'm just a speck of dirt. And you think about a speck of dirt. That's all we are. Now, God thought enough of us to to die on the cross for us. Amen. But in, in, in the scheme of things, how insignificant we are, how frail we are, and the brevity of life. We only hear three score and ten years what God's promised. That's 70 years. The Bible says, if by reason a man live four score, his days full of sorrow. And I don't think that's always physical. I think it's because of the way you have to go through what you have to put up with in life. Turning the TV on now is is a burden. I mean, listening to what's going on is a burden. These struggles, Ms. Shelby, that you talked about that we see other families go through, it's a burden to watch people throw away their lives. It's, it's It's a burden for all that. Here you are, you got a country over here, the Ukraine, minding their own business, doing their own thing. And you got a a, a big country up north, like Kamala said, well, that's a small country. Got a big country, Russia, tax small country, in her elementary sarcastic way. And, uh, but they were minding their own business, and they go down there and kill kids and children, you know, kids and and, and mamas and daddies and, and, you know, and, it, 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 that's the sorrow I think we, 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 we deal with. Not just physical, but all the rest. But one of the things that David wanted to learn, he wanted to learn that truth more fully, and I end with this. In Ephesians 5 and verse 16, 
Paul tells us to redeem the time or re redeem the days or the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. We got so much to do in such a short time to do it. And boy, do we just, we're doing, we're doing what we can right now, but we need to just do more. There's more people that need to be told about Jesus. More churches need to be planted while the time of grace is here so that people can go to heaven. That's where, that's where my burden is. And, and there's going to come a time when grace is gone. One of the saddest scriptures, and it says this not just once but several times, all the way from the Old Testament into the New Testament. But there will come a time, the Lord said, when they will seek me, and they will not find me. But now we're in the time. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. But there's coming a time that all these people you love and all these people you see that we say we'll witness to tomorrow and we don't and then when it happens they were right and they're going to seek God but won't find Him. I often think what are the days are going to be following the rapture of the church. Now I know, there, I know what the Bible tells as far as what's going to be going on naturally and what's going to be going politically. But I'm talking about what is going to happen in Tallahassee, Alabama the day after the rapture. This is what I have pictured. There are going to be some people that are going to come to this church. They're going to come into this church to try to find hope. They're going to go to the church down the road. They're going to try to find hope. They're going to go to the next church try to find hope. But hope is gone. It's over. And then when Antichrist takes over, they're going to be so confused and such in a delusional mind they're going to say, there's our hope. And they're going to follow me. They're going to seek me, but won't find me. But we're in a day where they can seek, and now they can find me. I'll leave you with that. Father, we bow before you tonight. We thank you again for the things that we can just learn from the Psalms that, Lord, you gave us. Lord, we know that we have but a short time to do the things that you've called us to do. I pray that we'll be serious about it. That we'll be involved in it. And Father, I pray that Father, we will just be obedient to you in every way. We pray that Father, that Lord, that we'll present the gospel, that we'll see souls saved. Just get the gospel out any way we can to those that Lord will hear it. Even to those that turn it down, the Lord will give it to them anyway. But Father, I pray that, Lord, you'll be lifted up. You've told us in your word that if you be lifted up, that you would draw all men to you. All we have to do is lift you up. And I pray that when we leave here tonight, wherever we go, that that's what we'll do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.